In an era where some of Ubisoft's biggest franchises have fallen by the wayside, either through total negligence or by their slow and painful decay, it's hard not to notice how Watch Dogs sticks out as a success story, the obvious beneficiary of a lot of care and a noteworthy attention to detail. While on a gameplay level, the series is clearly going from strength to strength, it seems that Ubisoft have taken notice of the franchise's biggest hurdle, that being on a narrative level, and have seen fit to course correct the problem in Watch Dogs Legion down to its very design philosophy. That is, of course, the issue with the series' previous protagonists, Aiden Pierce and Marcus Holloway, and some of the ways in which they have failed to resonate with the audience, or how their characterization has clashed with the gameplay inherent to the franchise. This time around, Watch Dogs Legion has been constructed so that there is no main character, and that you can play as practically anyone, which is a shrewd decision that proves aside from any other franchise, Ubisoft have their fingers on the pulse when it comes to Watch Dogs. But in order to demonstrate how abandoning the concept of a main character could ever be a good idea, we need a little Watch Dogs history lesson on our previous protagonists. Starting of course, with Aiden Pierce. The original Watch Dogs presents players with a grim and dismal depiction of the city of Chicago, as well as an equally grim protagonist in the form of Aiden Pierce. After a job goes wrong and his niece is killed as a result, Aiden is haunted by memories of her murder, distorted by digital artifacts which highlights his obsession not just with getting justice for Lena, but with the ways in which technology allow him to manipulate and control others. Aiden sees himself as the inheritor of a violent streak that inevitably causes him to seek out fights. And after spending many years as a criminal in Chicago's underworld, and seeing the failure of the police and the media in following up on Lena's death, decided to channel that fire into something good. And thus, Aiden became the vigilante. Over time, he began using Bloom's profiling software to track and prevent crimes in real time, partly to bring Chicago's criminal element to justice, but more so to fulfill the dark need for revenge, and as a distraction from the thoughts that plague him. Aiden is trained both in hand-to-hand -hand fighting and firearms, and went to great pains in order to study psychology and social engineering to be able to subjugate his victims without it ever coming to blows. Something noted by Clara in their first meeting when he employs textbook intimidation tactics on her. I'll start there. Hey, I'm sorry I was rough before. I know what you were doing, trying to intimidate me. Very textbook. He is highly intelligent, regularly setting up ambushes and other scenarios in such a way that he always maintains maximum control, efficiently sneaking into restricted areas and killing and stealing whatever is necessary to help further his cause. Whether that's stealing a few bucks from a random citizen on the street, or Bloom's deepest, darkest secrets, both are a means to an end. After all, Aiden's quest is a deeply personal one, one concerned with finding answers and getting vengeance. Aiden does not seek to change wider society, even while being aware of the systemic issues caused by his enemies. Instead, he only seeks to put an end to the way criminals victimize the innocent. That's why the game ends with Aiden killing the man who caused his suffering, and not with him leaking information to DedSec or other outlets. Even when he seeks to shut down CTOS, it's purely to find Damien and nothing more. To that end, Aiden isn't trying to be seen as a good guy, he's simply satisfying a need. In fact, he's very open to Clara about his preparedness to kill in order to protect his family, as well as how he reveled in the slow, torturous death of Lucky Quinn. The biggest problem is the extent to which this very personal, very focused quest conflicts with the very nature of the open world sandbox that Watch Dogs provides. In a game like Grand Theft Auto V, the spectacle and scope of an open world and the zany over-the-top storyline go hand in hand to create a harmony of exaggeration. In Watch Dogs, the story is relatively grounded and takes itself quite seriously, leaving little room for levity other than what naturally arises out of Aiden's newfound relationships. Was that so hard? No. The story of a miserable man seeking answers to a personal tragedy is far more suited to a more linear and focused game, which would allow the protagonist's story to unfold at a steady and deliberate pace. Instead, Watch Dogs' legitimately compelling story about dealing with loss, hubris, and consequences is severely hindered by the ability to forego urgent story missions in favor of the sandbox shenanigans present in any open world title. Much as the experience the game is trying to provide is muddied by these factors, Aiden's characterization and place within the world he inhabits is also bolstered by a number of other gameplay elements, most notably the fixer contracts and gang hideouts. After establishing Aiden as a vigilante who openly searches for crimes to prevent, it makes total sense that he would stake out gangs, infiltrate their operations, and take them out, non-lethally or 
otherwise. It also makes sense that due to his past and present dealings with the underworld, Aiden would owe favours and do odd jobs for money that would otherwise be distasteful. With the fixer contracts, the player is in control of giving texture to just how far Aiden will go, and outside of the canon events of the game, determining his moral compass too. Do too many fixer contracts and you may feel Aiden has betrayed his own mission by helping more criminals than he's stopping. Don't do enough and you may find it unrealistic that he's willing to do a bunch of bad stuff in the story with no precedent. It's totally up to you. Aiden may not be the most fun character to spend time with in a video game, even diehard fans would be hard pressed to argue otherwise, but there's a consistency to his character that is greatly aided by many of the gameplay opportunities within Watch Dogs that bears recognition. With that said, the lack of out and out fun, mired in a depressing narrative which is undercut by the whimsy of an open world, generates an experience that is unfortunately muddled, and sadly constantly distracts from itself as a result. Watch Dogs 2 rather quickly introduces the player to the systemic injustices that protagonist Marcus Holloway has suffered under, wasting no time distinguishing the newcomer from previous protagonist Aiden Pierce. Marcus is distinct from Aiden in just about every way, doubtlessly a deliberate move on Ubisoft's part in order to course correct the reception the latter received. And nowhere is this made clearer than when Marcus is face to face with his own criminal record, made up of assumptions and aspersions based on nothing more than contextless pieces of data. From here it's clear that Marcus's fight is broad, much broader in scope than Aiden's mission for revenge. But even though his fight is bigger, and he has suffered under the system, Marcus himself isn't bogged down by the same misery and anger that Aiden is. In fact, Marcus is usually quite jovial, as much about getting the job done as he is about making jokes and pop culture references with his dead sec buddies. All while humiliating the corporations they fight against, of course. For Marcus, much of the appeal in joining DeadSec is belonging to something. The ability to work together with others towards a goal that they all agree is righteous. The sense of community found in fighting against Bloom's overbearing presence in society is also a prominent feature in their struggle. Even going to war against rival hackers as they try and take down Silicon Valley's culture of collusion and cronyism. But perhaps the most important element of Marcus's role as the protagonist is that he lacks the means to an end mentality of his forebear. And while it's clear that he respects Aiden Pierce and his long list of accomplishments, Marcus objects to brutalizing people even if it means granting him access to where he needs to go. Which is why it's important that Watch Dogs 2 places such an emphasis on non-lethality, in order to maintain the integrity and empathy of the hacktivist troublemakers the game wants the player to warm up to. While non-lethal options existed in the first game, in the form of merciless beatings and severe electric shocks, it was necessary to emphasize the non-lethal stun gun as Marcus's default and arguably canon weapon of choice. After all, the fun and whimsy of spending time with DedSec and sticking it to the man would have been severely compromised if Marcus were going around gunning down everyone in his way. Drinking beer, spraying graffiti, and trolling billionaires one minute, and canonically murdering civilians the next, would generate a tonal whiplash that it would be impossible to recover from, as well as create characters whose motivations the player would have no hope of sympathizing with. On top of the stun gun, Marcus has access to remote controlled vehicles in the form of the jumper and the drone, which, when working in tandem, can mean that he never even has to step foot in a facility in order to accomplish his missions never raising the alarm, and never being forced into combat. This approach lends further credence to the idea that DedSec's priority is not to be excessively violent in their pursuits, only doing what is necessary to get the job done and to protect themselves at the same time. In this way, the aims of DedSec and the gameplay elements available to the player are in sync. That is, of course, until it comes to the hacking itself. A substantial amount of the hacking abilities left over from Aiden's time terrorizing Chicago return in Watch Dogs 2 and, in tandem with many of the new abilities, leave much to be desired when painting a consistent picture of Marcus Holloway. After all, the player is presented with a character that seeks to inform and empower the disenfranchised population, which is rather at odds with indiscriminately lifting money, disrupting traffic, and calling a gang hit on a random passerby. Of course, all of this is rather simple to ignore, especially within the context of the constant online events the game has to offer, but it's still worth mentioning for any players seeking to be particularly invested in Marcus and Co. without feeling the dissonance that Aiden could sometimes provide. Killing is an intrinsic and important part of Aiden's journey, but in Marcus's it feels totally out of place even as a gameplay necessity. For Marcus, justice doesn't come in the form of a bullet in the head, or a slow painful death at the hands of a malfunctioning pacemaker. Justice comes when all the people responsible for the corrupt system find themselves in handcuffs and accountable to all the people they exploited. 
The minute-to-minute -minute gameplay of Watch Dogs 2 and the new hacking abilities available to Marcus help in making San Francisco feel like a hacker's playground. The ability to move cars around remotely, disable security devices, and even turn off electric doors that your enemies are about to walk through automatically injects the sense of playfulness inherent to Marcus's attitude, since humorous situations are naturally going to arise from the player experimenting with new tools. To that end, telling a grimdark revenge story would totally fall flat in amongst all the chaos Watch Dogs 2 has to offer, and it was a wise decision to make the narrative, and our hero Marcus, much more sanguine as a result. Especially when considering his available actions would cast severe doubts on his moral fortitude. So it's been demonstrated that there is often a disconnect between the narrative and gameplay in the Watch Dogs games that can negatively affect the way the player views the protagonists. Sure. That's basically true of any open world game, so why bother focusing on Aiden and Marcus specifically? Well aside from the way in which other games contextualise the wide variety of moral choices the player has in an open world, the most important factor is how Watch Dogs protagonists have been remembered in certain circles until now, especially compared to contemporaries such as Geralt from The Witcher or Trevor from GTA V. Critics of the two previous heroes are quick to deride them as either an edgy, joyless neckbeard or a cringy hipster douchebag respectively. And while the severe lack of nuance makes it clear that these are not good faith appraisals of Aiden or Marcus, the fact remains this sentiment exists in the zeitgeist all the same. That's where Watch Dogs Legion and its decentralization of the very concept of a protagonist comes in. As distinct from the idea of a custom character or otherwise silent protagonist, which are very much gaming staples at this point, Legion makes it so that anyone can be a playable character, thus removing the burden of carrying the narrative from any one character or their foibles. This is principally achieved by emphasizing the player's agency, both in allowing them to form their own unique team of DedSec operatives, and in what those operatives are willing to do in order to get the job done. This, in tandem with a city where even the oppressive military presence is reluctant to draw a gun first, forces the burden of lethality onto the player. When, if ever, will they be willing to use lethal force? And which of their operatives will be the one to do it? The direct consequence of this tactic is that the player is met with a richer, contextualized narrative, and the problem of ludonarrative dissonance that the series has previously struggled with is completely steamrolled over, especially since neither approach is particularly incentivized in gameplay this time around. There is no conflict between the canon and the player's decisions anymore. The player determines the canon. But this system goes even deeper. Each operative the player recruits will have a brief biography describing them, a list of relationships with other NPCs as well as a summary of recent deeds. The history of each character and the people they've interacted with are chronicled in real time and have a direct impact in the game world by intertwining in often unexpected ways. Gang members that you knock unconscious will have been harassing one of your DedSec members on the side. The person being victimised by Albion will be the cousin of the character you're currently playing as. The list goes on. Now certainly, in moments such as these, you can choose not to intervene and there won't be any sort of consequence. And that can make the entire endeavour feel a little like a facade. One of the pitfalls of having such a robust system that depends on random chance and player whimsy is a lack of payoff to the narratives that get carved out through gameplay. And as a result, won't be to everyone's taste. However, I think the spontaneous moments of walking past your character's spouse, or accidentally running over another character's lawyer, or the significantly increased scope for roleplaying based on loadouts and character traits, means that there's more positives than negatives to be found here. After all, the question of whether DedSec are petty nuisances, freedom fighters, or even terrorists, is ultimately up to the player to decide in Legion. It gives them the ability to answer the question that the Watch Dogs series has been stumbling over from the very beginning, and it allows their open world gameplay to be totally uninhibited by a narrative that conspicuously ignores their misdeeds, or otherwise fails to remain consistent. If you found yourself unmoved by Aiden's desire for revenge in the original Watch Dogs, Legion will allow you to beat the shit out of someone that killed your family immediately after you saw it happen. If you found yourself totally disinterested in the hypocritical sanctimony the gang was capable of in Watch Dogs 2, Legion will allow you to put your money where your mouth is by giving you the option of never laying a hand on anyone or mercilessly slaughtering any opposition to your goal. By charging players with the job of assembling their own hand-picked crew and leaving the ludonarrative cohesion in their hands, Ubisoft has issued a challenge to players who may have previously been unable to connect with the characters in the franchise thus far. Here, they said, Make your own team, one you can fully resonate with. And while the results could not possibly be as deep as a formally constructed narrative, and perhaps for many people that's a good thing, 
The developers have deftly circumvented potentially the biggest issue plaguing an otherwise highly successful franchise. All while delivering an expanded form of the chaotic and engaging hacker gameplay that the series is known for. 